say again, let no one think me a fool. If otherwise, at least receive me as a fool. That's why, if you read this, you will begin to understand what I mean. My Paul was very sarcastic. And you must understand the background of statements like this. For Paul to say, let no one think me as a fool. If otherwise, at least receive me as a fool for today. Receive me as a fool. You must understand what led him and pushed him to begin to speak like this. Why would Paul write a letter and begin to say, Today, receive me as a fool. That I also may boast a little. The word boast can also be brag. What I speak, I speak not according to the Lord. That's a very important statement here. When he says, I speak not according to the Lord. Because for many of Paul's writings, they were received from God. And he spoke as inspired by God. His words were described as the word of God. But for a few minutes, Paul was angry and he said, This one I'm not talking as God. Let me talk as me. What I speak, I speak not as according to the Lord, but as it were foolishly in the confidence of boasting. Seeing that many boast according to the flesh, I also will boast. For you are put up with fools gladly, since you yourselves are wise. Once again, sarcasm. <laughs> For you put up with it if one brings you into bondage, if one divorces you, if one takes from you, if one exalts himself, if one strikes you on the face. That was shame. I said that we were too weak for that sarcasm. But in whatever anyone is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? What they Hebrews refers to? The people that were, as it were, contesting with Paul concerning the, the Corinthian church with respect to authority. There were other people Paul referred to as super apostles. Who, as it were, were distracting the Corinthian church from submitting to the authority of Paul. And Paul says, it seems as if those guys have your attention. And they brag a lot. They boast a lot. So since it's about boasting, let me also boast my own boast. Are they Hebrews? Do they speak about being Hebrews? <laughs> so am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? <laughs> he says, I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundance, in stripes above measures, in prisons more frequently. Every time you see the phrase I speak as a fool, it's referring to I'm speaking in the capacity of a mere man. I'm speaking honestly. I'm laying down my heart. I'm not talking like a prepared preacher. I'm just talking because he paid me. Are we still together here? That's the background. When you read this these chapters understand what Paul is trying to convey. In stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. How many is that? Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. The word deep is the deep of waters. The depth of waters. In journeys often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils of the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things which comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches, who is weak and I'm not weak, who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation. If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I'm not lying. Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king, was guarding the city of the Damascenes with a garrison desiring to arrest me. But I was led down in a basket through a window in the wall and escape from his hands. Confessions of a pastor. Let's pray one minute here. Holy Spirit, give life to your word. Let there be clarity and conviction. Let there be transformation. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Confessions of a pastor. The pastoral office is a very important office between God and God's people. Very, very important office. I know that this office over the years has, as it were, been relegated. Many people speak about apostles today and prophets today. And then the pastoral office seemed to be diluted in importance and in weight. But it's a very crucial office from the very beginning of God's dealings with his people. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15. God himself says, I will raise you pastors. I will send you pastors. I will send you pastors after my own heart that will feed you, nourish you. God is the one who sends pastors. Jeremiah 3 15, please. He's the one who appoints pastors. It's not a denominational tag. It's not something that a man gives to himself. And you may say, why does God not feed his people directly? It is the pattern of God to raise shepherds. This word shepherds in the King James is pastor. And please, if you have the King James, I prefer you use that when I ask for other versions. I would prefer you now switch. They will feed you with knowledge and understanding. So what is the work of a pastor? Feed with knowledge and understanding. A pastor is not there as a celebrity figure. When people say, you are my pastor, the first question is, are you receiving my feeding? Am I feeding you with knowledge and understanding? It's not enough to just say, you are the leader of the church I attend. <laughs> I'm not just a figurehead. Am I feeding you? Are you eating from my kitchen? If I'm not feeding you, don't, you, you don't, if, you, if you don't understand, that's the biblical definition. I'm not feeding you. I may be the leader of the church you attend, but I'm not your pastor. This is what it is. So the point is this. God is the one who has ordained the pastoral office. And the purpose is to feed with knowledge and understanding. Jeremiah 23 and verse 1. The same is given as it were in a warning. Woe to shepherds. Please leave it in the King James Version. When I want another version, I will ask you. Okay? But please leave it in the King James Version. When I want another version, I would ask you. Thank you. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. So he begins to warn, he begins to rebuke. The sheep of God's pasture is very important. And any pastor who wants to lead the sheep and does not understand the implication, they will have to come to terms with truths like this. Woe, cursed. Woe, cursed. Is there any pastor that destroys and scatters the sheep of my pasture? It is my pasture, God says. When I see people eager to be pastors, I wonder, do you know the implication? It's not about collecting dangerous seed, receiving tithe and offering. If you mess with God's sheep, as a pastor, the implication is massive. Are we still together here? He says, Whoa. It's my pasture. They are my sheep. You are supposed to be a pastor over them, but ultimately, I am the chief shepherd. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 1 to 4. You see that phrase. You notice in the other versions that we have been seeing, New King James, instead of pastor, you see shepherd. And you see sheep and pasture. Now, um, in First Peter, interestingly, the only New Testament mention in the King James of pastor is Ephesians 4:11. But the concept is a shepherd concept. So, if you see your Bible shepherd referring to woman, that's a pastor. Are we still together here? So, when Peter speaks here, elders which are among you are exhort. He's talking to pastors actually. The reason was that in those days. 
The church did not meet in buildings often. They met at home. You hear Reverend George say, for instance, the church in Ephesus was about 44,000. It's not like they gathered together 44,000 people. It was that by networks of home cells and home fellowships, as it were, everything accumulated to about 44,000. But Timothy was the, uh, the overall overseer. So he was called the bishop, as it were. Which refers to the overall overseer of the church in Ephesus. Are we still together now? Yes, so the elders, which are amongst you, I exhort, who am also an elder. So Peter, you can say Peter is an apostle. But Peter said I'm also an elder. Why? Because even the apostolic office also has pastoral duties. And a witness of the service of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Fit the flock. So you see the word again, flock. Elders are pastors. They are shepherds. They are supposed to fit the flock of God, which is amongst you. That's the purpose of a pastor, to feed the flock. Taking the oversight thereof, not by constraints, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. What filthy lucre is basically for gain, personal gain, selfish ambitions. Neither has been lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. See the word again, flock. And when the chief shepherd, which is Jesus, shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So you understand from all these verse, verses of scriptures we have been quoting who a pastor is supposed to be. And in case you think you have a pastor, you need to be aware of what the Bible calls a pastor. The purpose of that pastor. So that you don't think you have a pastor and in the day God checks your record, he sees that you have no pastor because you are not feeding from anybody. You are not learning knowledge from anybody. You may take selfies with me, doesn't mean I'm your pastor. <laughs> You may come and sit down when I'm teaching. It does not mean I'm your pastor. The work of the pastor is to feed God's people with knowledge. Feed with knowledge. Are we still together here? It's not. Some of you learn dressing from me. Or some of you learn dressing from the person you call your pastor. That's not his purpose. I'm not saying that's a wrong thing. But that's not his primary purpose. If you're not feeding from him, you're not, it's not administering knowledge to you. And anytime you want to make a decision, you remember what did my pastor teach me? You don't have a pastor. If you want to make a decision, make a decision, and my words does not come to your mind as what, what will PJ do in this situation? What has PJ said about this matter? I'm not your pastor. It is what it is. <laughs> your seed may be very dangerous. Your generosity to this house will be surplus. But primarily, we don't exist for filthy lucre. We're not after your gain. We are not even lords over God's heritage. We are examples of the flock. Examples. Examples in doctrine, in life, in teachings. So come to reality. Come to terms with reality. Who exactly is a pastor? Who exactly am I learning from? For some of you, brother Davido is your pastor. That's the truth. You learn from him. His music powers your life. Your own impartation service is to plug his words and get high. That's how you get high. His philosophy of love and sex is your own philosophy. He's your pastor. That's the truth. You may put sticker on your car, Rema, winner, redeemer. <laughs> the person that fits you with knowledge, that's your pastor. Are you listening to me here? Let's not spiritualize the concept. Let's <laughs> not spiritualize the concept. It's just whoever teaches you. It's like your lecturer. Whoever you are learning from, this thing you are doing, where do you learn it from? That's your pastor. <laughs> the person may not wear suit and tie, may not stand on the pulpit. But if the person determines your life, determines your choices, determines your decision, that's your pastor. Are we still together here now? Yes, so, in the sacred business of pastoring, or the sacred office of pastoring, there is no room for personal sentiment. But let me say it like this, there is little room for personal sentiment. Because a pastor is supposed to feed the sheep. What does he feed the sheep with? He feeds the sheep with God's word. 
It does not fit the sheep with his own opinion. It does not fit the sheep with his personal bias that will be poison or will be toxic. There is no or little room for personal opinion. The pastor cannot bring his own opinion to the table and say, come and eat. No. He is not the chief shepherd. He is an under shepherd. The chief shepherd is like the chef that cooks the meal. The under shepherd is the steward that serves the meal. The under shepherd does not cook the meal. He just goes to the kitchen. Whatever the chef has cooked, he picks it up and he serves the table. You feed from the steward, but it is not the steward that cooks the meal. Is the chef. That's why Paul says, count us apostles as stewards of the manifold grace of God. That's what he meant by that. I wish to together here now. No room for personal sentiment. No room for personal bias. No, and very little room for personal opinion. You've got to stay with the script and teach the people as God commands. Unfortunately, this is not so in today's world. There are many pastors with personal opinion. I was reading one on Twitter the other day. And he said, there is nothing bad with premarital sex. There is a difference between premarital sex and fornication. He said, fornication is when you are sleeping around anyhow. And then premarital sex is when you are sleeping with somebody you have, you have a commitment with. When I see those kind of things, the first thing I want to check is, who is your pastor? I go and check the pastor of that pastor. Who, who, whose post has he been sharing? Who has he been endorsing? Who has been endorsing him? That's how I identify fix. Then I now check who have been deceived by him. I saw one person say, this makes sense. I say, ah, they've got you. Once you get here, say, this makes sense. No wonder. I say, ah. <laughs> Wolves in sheep clothing. Personal opinion, personal sentiments, because of your horniness, you invent a doctrine. <laughs> The pastor only echoes the words of the chief, chief shepherd. Second Corinthians 4 and verse 5. We do not preach ourselves, but we preach Christ. Paul, yeah, right, he says, we cannot preach ourselves. Ourselves is not sufficient diet for the people of God. I'm not going to preach about my opinion, my perspective, my bias, my sen sen sentiment. I'm going to preach Christ. If I'm going to talk about myself, it is that I am a servant for your sake. And when Paul said this, he really implicated himself. But some, let, some chapters after this statement, you see Paul breaking his own laws. Are we still together here? Try and understand what I'm saying. This is a very technical teaching. If you miss one point, you might miss the flow himself says I cannot preach myself I preach Christ because now Christ go fit edify you now Christ go fit bless you I cannot in my, my own self edify you but some chapters down the line you see him breaking as it were his own laws what do I mean when Paul wrote he wrote as the servant of God he wrote as the mouthpiece of God he spoke as one inspired by the Holy Ghost. But there were a few occasions you see him speaking about himself. On a few occasions. And you must say, as a Christian, you must be intelligent enough to know why did Paul speak about himself here? Why is Paul talking about himself? Why is Paul boasting as it were? Why? He himself said we should only preach Christ. Why is he now breaking his own laws? You must understand. Look at it in 2 Corinthians 11. We read that. And verse 16 to 18. Why would Paul speak like this? Let no man think me of a fool if otherwise. Yet as a fool receive me that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord. Why? Why Paul? Why would you no longer speak after the Lord? But as well foolishly, that he is in myself, in my flesh, in this confidence of boasting. 
What pressure pushed Paul to now, in trying to convey another thought, speak of himself? Look at it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8 to 10. This experience was Paul's personal experience. And he didn't need to write it in a letter. For we would not, brethren, have the ignorance of our trouble which came to us in Asia. Amen. Amen. When you read the Bible, try and make it a living book. This is a real letter from a real human being. Paul speaks about his trouble in Asia. So how about I come to you and I say, The other day I went to preach. And when I preached, finished, there was trouble. I did not carry down some money. The people gave me five alive. So I had to beg to enter bus to come back home. That would not necessarily be the word of God. It is my personal experience being shared. Do you understand me now? So when Paul is talking about his troubles, what exactly is he saying it for? Why is he talking about his trouble? So he is a servant of God. And all you should do is to communicate the opinion of God, the, the dealings of God, the words of God. That we were pressed out of measure above strength. Why would Paul be speaking about the pressure that came to his life and ministry? In so much that we despaired even of life. Why would Paul be speaking about a tendency to, as it were, be suicidal to his audience? It is a very difficult thing for a man to write to those who is responsible over and speak about his personal weakness and confess. I said, there was a time the trouble was so much, I nearly died. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves. In other words, in fact, we were as good as dead. That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raised the dead. Who delivered us from so great a death. And thus deliver in whom we trust that they will yet deliver us. So what am I saying? Paul is looking for sympathy. He wants the people to pity him. That's why he's talking like this. Not really, not really, not really. Paul is confessing personal experiences for one major reason. So that the people will understand his ministry and appreciate his office. Many of us can never appreciate an office that you don't understand. You don't understand the trauma, the torture, the sufferings that a pastor goes through you don't so you don't find it anything to be grateful you know i'm the one suffering i go through depression pastor is up there he's a superman he never suffers he prays like this five minutes god answers his own prayer we in our five days god never will hear us that's what you think so paul will say let me confess you think i'm a superman right you think I have it all easy? You are angry with God. Why? He not give you a husband. Me, my own wife, leave me because of ministry. Some people come and tell me things. And I look at them and the only thing that I can, I can say sometimes is that if I tell you my own story, you start pitying me. Yeah. Confessions of a pastor. If I, because you make it look like, oh, all hell is against me. If I tell you my own story, Paul said we despaired even to life. We lost our father for life. The trouble was so much, it felt like it would have been better for us to die. Why did he mention that kind of a thing to them? How would that edify them? It will help them to appreciate his office. When he speaks, maybe they will listen more. When he tells them about endurance and long suffering, maybe they will listen more. They will not think he is out of their world. He cannot feel their pain. Are we still together now? Yeah. Sometimes I come and talk here. And you are thinking, he doesn't understand because I've not confessed to you. Don't sleep around, no coming fornication. He says, if you are married, you cannot understand. You don't know what conji is. Never catch you before. So you be pastor. Pastor, you get feeling. You know they get feeling now. Huh? So be your body in a uh, wood. So in the day I tell you I caught it for seven years and I caught it a fine girl. My fiance was not what what. She was fine. She is fine. She will be fine. 
And for seven years, I could not touch. Touch not the anointed. So when I tell you, you if I tell you, stop that nonsense, you don't think I'm, I'm talking about some abstract alien experience. I felt your infirmity. Are you listening to me? Yes, sir. That's why we confess. You feel my pain, you understand that when I give you an instruction, I'm not speaking out of range. That's the priesthood office. Jesus had to come and was tempted in every way, yet without sin. So when he says, guy, you can overcome. When that pastor says that, he means it. He's been in your shoes and probably even worse. Are we still together here? When you see Paul, as it were, bringing personal sentiment. When you see a preacher giving a sermon titled Confessions of a Pastor. Why? What is he trying to achieve? He wants you to appreciate his ministry. You are not going to appreciate his ministry until you understand his frailties. Understand his experiences. Understand, understand his temptations. Understand his trials. Understand his pain. Understand his sacrifice. Now when you are tempted to be rebellious, you may understand better than, ah, mm -mm. not to Paul, not to Peter, not to James, not to Judah, not to Jesus. They have paid their dues. Whatever they are demanding is just basic gratitude. Are we still together here? That's why Paul would confess and bring personal sentiment, as it were, into his writings. You will not maximize the ministry of the pastor. This does not just apply to me. I know that for many people here, I will never pastor you forever. You will go ahead with your life and have other pastors. So this is not just a sermon for my empire, as it were. Many of you are not going to maximize your pastoral gifts. And I mean the gift of your pastor in future, if you don't learn this thing now, I'm teaching you. And when next your pastor is speaking, you may not know where he's talking from. You might think we come here to preach because we feel like preaching and we enjoy preaching. You will not know where he's coming from. So learn the confessions of a pastor. Learn the trials of a pastor. Learn the pain of a pastor. And some of you will become pastors in future. Mm. It's better you prepare your mind ahead of time. So that you will not be in for a rude shock. Say, I didn't know that that's how it was, so... I told the church on Wednesday, for those of you who were here, many people saw Moses and said, Moses! Prophet Agba, Agba prophet. You don't know the pain of that man. You don't know. You won't know until you read the story and see the torment. I didn't show you on Wednesday. Yourself. He begged God twice. God, please, I served you faithfully. Remove that judgment of me. No entry promise that God said, don't talk about this matter again. Don't talk about don't, this matter. Don't talk about it again. Kai. This was the same man that in the day God was going to destroy Israel. He said, kill me instead. He no go touch them. God. How, how will you destroy them? And in the day he begged God for his own. He said, God, please. I did only one thing. Only one thing. Please. And that one thing he did. Now Israel pushed him. Some of you cannot relate. You just think it's all about <laughs> Ode Mike, Rod of Moses, Parting Red Sea. You don't know the pain, the anguish, the sorrow, the bitterness in the soul of a shepherd. So when you see them come and teach, teach you, are excited, teach you, you are happy. You don't, you don't see it as anything. You don't even think they have worked. <laughs> you think they are just playing. So you don't think they need to be appreciated. You don't think so. Because what have they done? They are doing their hobby now. It's what they like doing that they have done. Somebody will see Moses praying to God and think, what is he doing? He's br he brought manna from heaven. What, what is that? Eh, it's not his job. And yet, in the day that man said, God, please, let me see the promised land. Because he, don't talk, don't see, just keep quiet. Go on and over to Joshua. But you wouldn't know that part of the story if it was not documented. If, some, if nobody confessed to you. Are we still listening here? Yes, sir. The confessions of a pastor. It will help you to appreciate the pastoral office. It will help you to maximize the pastoral office. It will help you to act into the pastoral office, to take heed to it, to receive it with all sobriety and gratitude. When Paul spoke in that letter, and he said, suffer me to be a fool, permit me to be a fool. All 
this is why I've written to you as a servant of God. For once, I want to speak as a man. You think you guys have suffered? Have you ever suffered shipwreck? Do you know what it is to be in the deep of the waters? Beaten by rods three times. Thirty-nine times. Have you ever? You think you are suffering? You think you hurt? You don't know hurt. Why did he speak like that? The more they understood what he went through, the more they might appreciate his office, understand the sacrifice, learn that whatever he was doing for them was out of inconvenience. The confessions of a pastor. Let me mention five confessions here. This is not just personal. It is general for almost every pastor that I've met. And you can run the basic statistics to identify these issues that will be raised to see how many pastors go through these issues and never tell anybody. <laughs> A pastor's funeral is always very, very sad. Because people who have never appreciated him while he was alive now begin to say, eh, he was a good man, no. Why didn't you speak up when he was alive? Why? He thought he all had it figured out. He thought he never needed encouragement. He thought he didn't have his struggles. The day he dies, he says, ah, let me write an epistle. Keep your epistle to yourself. The day he was alive, did you ever, did you ever show gratitude? You see people coming from various quarters. What this man did for me? Hey! But you never spoke about this now when he was alive. Why is he now he's dead? You are talking about it. what I learned from this person. Hey! But when he was alive, you never ever identified with him. You never even publicly associated with him. Now he's dead. You're acting all sorrowful. Yeah. That's how life is. <laughs> confessions of a pastor. Five confessions here. Pastoral sufferings and sacrifice. I will amplify it. Even though I've emphasized this a little bit before. The confessions of sufferings, sacrifice, stress. Pastoral is hard work. It is labor. Some of you, like I said earlier, see it as enjoyment. See it as a bad thing. And in a world today where there are many false pastors... Pastors who, in the day, they were ordinary church members. They were very, very thin and slim and looking malnourished. Six months after they became pastors, everywhere, cheek, they blow up. Luxury and wealth. And that's how many of you think that pastoring is a lucrative job. There are very few true shepherds who are actually laboring. Many pastors are not laboring. And I know. You will hear someone, you know this one did not label. Oh, well, film. A little label. If you label to show your delivery, you label to show. A little label. Ball on wo. Saturday, that's not my long wo. Go label. Many people not label. They come and say, hey! The Spirit of God said, we should sing. It's a lie. You did not prepare. You didn't prepare. Every day, Spirit of God, we should see every day. Let your flow with the Spirit is a lie. That's flow with the flesh. There are many idle pastors, lazy pastors, but two shepherds labor. And you see, you hear them, you know this one is laboring. <laughs> this is work here. It's not, it's not child's play. If it's child's play, go and try it, huh? Go and get it elsewhere. Let's see. If it's child's play, if you think it's that easy, go and do it now. Can't obtain it from any other source. Let's see. Pastor is work. It's toil. Sleepless nights. Untold. Toil. Hard work. Look at Paul's testimony and confession here. Second. Rather, first Timothy 5 and verse 17 to 18. Well, this was not even a confession. It was just an instruction based on the revelation of pastoral labor. Let the elders, now we read in 1 Peter 5 that the word elders actually refers to pastoral officers. 
Is that clear? Yes, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So the word and doctrine is not child's play. I always say doctrine will be your mate. Is labor. Many of you don't appreciate doctrine because you are not even really looking for truth. You know, you come to church and every day this man is just teaching, teaching, teaching. Uh uh. There is pastor You know the you know the C visa. Now so so the word of God says, the Bible says, the word of God says, the Bible says. But you don't know that this thing is labor, actually. And Paul says there are various kinds of labor. But the person that labors in the word and doctrine is the only person worthy of double honor. People labor in prophecy. Oh, yes. People labor in intercession. Oh, yes. But those who labor in the word and doctrine. Ah. Let me ask you, who would you rather honor? You see, a generation that has no value for the word cannot honor the word. Do not think that pastors who feed the people with the word should be honored. They don't. They don't. <laughs> what is he doing? See, he's just saying the Bible say. The Bible say. What is he doing? Verse eighteen. The Scripture says, "Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward." I've seen it happen again and again. Sometimes it is not necessarily even with respect to just pastoral and prophetic, should I say, rivalry. It is on issues as the pastor and the itinerant preacher. Many people never really honor those who consistently labor over them. They rather honor those who labor over them once in a lifetime. <laughs> Or once in a year. That's for them, the person who do of double. The person who consistent is like somebody. You know, I was saying it on the media. Somebody has a wife cooking three times a day, feeding four children, plus visitors on low budget in Nigeria's economy. The husband has never appreciated that. Another person dresses half naked, goes on stage. Announces a rivalry competition and she becomes the toast of the whole world. And husbands who have never appreciated their wife's cooking skills said, Ha! That person, he, she's so diligent. You didn't taste the food. How do you know she's diligent? The food you have been eating every day for you have been married 13 years. You have never said, My wife, you do so much. He said, uh, it's a work now. Eh. Eh. For some people, once it's you, are, you are consistently blessing them, they cannot appreciate you. They prefer the one that blesses them once in a while. Why? That's the one that they... Ah! <laughs> but when it's consistent, they feel that it becomes their right. Many people say, I don't owe you anything. Well, I also don't owe you anything. You come to church, I can come and sing. I have a singing ministry too. I can I will do album. I usually do album four times. I will make I will make money from it. If I choose to labor and teach you, I don't owe you. I don't owe you anything. If you don't, if you are not grateful, oh because you don't know that it is work. Are you hearing me? Yes, sir. Pastor, when he says they that labor in the ministry of the word and doctrine, they deserve double honor. The, another translation says double salaries. People labor in other things. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not against other people's labor. I'm saying the person who is an elder, that is a pastor, who is laboring in the word and doctrine, that's the person that deserves double, double. Unfortunately, many Christians don't read the Bibles, so this does not apply to them. <laughs> and that's how many people break the laws of honor. And they think they are honoring somebody. And God, they say, this person you are honoring is not the person you should honor. You just don't know. You don't know. And I'll show you why that is so many times. It is because true pastors, true servants of God, true shepherds, will not go the extent 
that that or that super shepherd or superstar shepherd will go the extent of bragging. They pushed Paul. Paul said, You want me to brag? You want me to brag? You can read the entire conversation. Go to chapter 12. Paul said, You want me to brag? I visited the third heavens. You, you, think, you think I don't have visions? You think I don't have encounters? I don't talk about you because I'm supposed to preach only Christ. You want me to brag? Maybe I'll, I'll brag for just one minute. And he began to speak. You saw that they, they pushed him. They would not appreciate him. They won't listen to him until he bragged. He said, by the abundance of the revelation, it was so much, something had to be done to help me to stay humble. He want me to brag. <laughs> but true, true shepherds don't do that. They, they won't do that. If they do, they are pushed. And they do that just so that you can appreciate them. You will have to, however, be sensitive and decide. This man is laboring. Even if he does not brag, he's laboring. Are you with me here? Yes, sir. And I was speaking with Pastor Dipo. We were just talking about the way there's seemingly some noise from some quarters about some expressions of ministry. He was talking about songs. And we were complaining about the excessive excessive in our opinion forcing down of those ministries on people's truths and um, a pastor is advertising and advertising and advertising his song he wants everybody to get it there's nothing wrong with that so he was saying that i said ah, pj it's so like you come on your team song for here he did bless me i said i said that song for me is like <laughs> i said what i said, I said, I said I what is it I'm not going to brag about that. I'm not going to brag about that. You see, if now these other people, they for not push and push and push and push. I said, not be me. I push with it. I said, if I write a song today in church, I said, one of the reasons my, my church may not appreciate the song is because they know the next month another song will drop. <laughs> now it's it to it back to back. I know they, I know they shout at top of I go just go and come out. I go go and come out. We don't brag, but we know what we can do. And if we want to brag, we have something to brag about. But we will not brag. Except for this like this. Where it seems as if the people who are laboring over don't see it as labor. So we're going to tell them, what exactly do you think we are doing here? Let's compare notes. Even me, I'm beginning to talk like a fool now. <laughs> oh yeah, the confessions of a pastor. Paul saw that they had no, they had no value for his ministry. The confessions of sufferings, of sacrifice. First Timothy four ten. Paul writing to Timothy here. Therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Ministry, pastoring, doctrine, labor. We labor and suffer reproach. I know what it is to suffer reproach as a pastor. What do you do, sir? I'm a pastor. No, I mean, what do you do as a pastor? All I do is pastor. Uh -uh. Why? <laughs> I know it's a summary approach. And it seems like you are, you are idle, you don't want to work, that's why you are pastor. When well, they combine it now, uh, me too, I'm a pastor. <laughs> you too are a pastor. That's why when you talk, we don't see labor. You see that you have been distracted by much encumbrance. We don't see conviction. You have divided your labor. Paul could do other things. Tent maker, that was a skill he learned to make money when the people that he was laboring over were not appreciating him. Instead of begging or collecting dangerous prophetic seed. He learned to go and learn tent maker. But Paul was not always a tent maker. Because some people now say, there's nothing like full-time ministry. Uh-uh. 
Eh? All the letters he wrote, if he was making tents, will he have time to write it? In prison. Was he making tents in prison? And he wrote all the letters from prison. He doesn't have full time ministry. He just wasting their time. Young men wasting their life. <laughs> Suffer reproach. And you just take it and say, what's it going? When I under full time ministry at the age of 23, 23 years old, the man of God who bought me this Bible I use, and this Bible I still use, he said, Judah, you're too young for this. He said, why don't you? He said, at your age, I just entered university. Look at you, you're done with school, 23. And you want to waste your life on ministry? He said, why don't you do a master's? Get something done. He said, eventually they will ordain you. As pastor, where is pastor? They will eventually they will, ordain, they will give you that pastor. I could see his mentality. I said, thank you for your advice, sir. But this labor that I am called into cause for maximum consecration, my time is short and my work is plenty. He didn't understand. I'm sure we lost, we've lost communication, but I'm sure he looks at me or hears from me from time to time and says, Kai, this guy. Ha! This guy. Ha! It is labor. There's a reproach we suffer. We may not talk about it often because that's not what we edify you. We preach Christ and not ourselves. But today's a day of confessions. We suffer reproach. I entered into full time ministry. My mother disowned me. Oh, yeah. Didn't make any meaning to her. While I would spend four years in the University of Lawrence studying chemistry, and after I would say, I'm going to do full time ministry. She couldn't relate with it. Now she's very proud of me. That's my son, she says. But there were days of reproach. When nobody wanted to associate with me. There were days of reproach. And there are still days of reproach. We labor. We suffer. If you think it is child's play, come to the club. Come and join us. You think you because you, you for you even from now I'm standing, you are sitting. Some of you are sleeping. You think it's, it's easy. Come and come, come. <laughs> come. It's labor. Doctrine, preaching, teaching, making pasture available to the flock. To teach is one thing. So teach it in a way that is applicable to your audience, in a way that is edifying, in a way that is powerful, potent, labor, labor, labor. In a way that is relevant, labor. If you don't see it like that, you will never appreciate a pastor's office. What is he doing? People say, wait till lawyer they do, self. Because you have never needed bail. Police never catch you before. <laughs> That's what I say. Wait till lawyer they do, self. One man, senior advocate of Nigeria, you want to hire his service? One day, two million. Say, wait till they do. They never steal your mandate before. <laughs> it's labor. It's a lot of work. Work that sometimes cannot even be expressed. Look at how Paul says it in first, second Corinthians 11, 29. Look at the play of words and the choice of words. And then maybe you can try that in another version. Second Corinthians 11, 29. Speaking about his burden for the church. He says, who is weak and I am not weak. In other words, when somebody is frail, weak, sad, depressed, it automatically rubs off on Paul as the pastor. That you, 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 you are the pastor, you are happy for yourself. Your wife is a beautiful woman. Your boy is a brilliant boy. And you are supposed to be happy. And somebody calls you and says, Sir, I just lost my mother. And then you have to share in her sorrow automatically. Boom. Who is weak and I'm not? Who is offended and I born not? The word offended in the King James is not accurately as it were translated. Put it in another version. Maybe 
from the New King James, you see a more accurate emphasis. Who is led astray, and I do not born with anger. So I'm happy. I'm happy because my wife is doing well. Now some, some, I see that a church member is led astray, has fallen into temptation, has given himself to anger and wrath and other vices of Satan, and I lose my joy. And I begin to burn with anger because of another, not my own self, but because of another person's life. That's the labor of a pastor. He, cannot, he, he has to oscillate between various emotions. So, somebody just called him now and said, I lost my mother. Five minutes, somebody just calls him and said, I just gave back. He has to also say, ah, congratulations. In the same breath. Try it. If you think it's easy, come on, come on, try it. To mention, maintain emotional stability in a way that everybody feels they're not left out. You don't know the labels of a pastor. You don't. So, I'm confessing to you here. To hug somebody and the person cries on your shoulder in church. Walk up to somebody, the person, the person gives you a wild hug and you're supposed to switch emotions from receiving Christ and, and then to, oh yeah. <laughs> and it happens every other day. There are times I've been writing on the media and somebody who is, who as it were, I'm doing like media pastoring for media pastoring. I've not seen the person before, but I have to make myself available as a pastor in person. Gives me a news. And uh, what I'm typing, I say, I cannot type again. If the person reads it, and the person knows that I just shared with PJ bad news, and look at what he's saying. He's catching crews. He's sharing jokes. The person won't feel good, right? Some other time. You don't know the labels of a pastor. Are we still together here? Mm. I'm not saying it so that you will pity me. I'm saying it so that you can understand my office. When I speak, you can understand where I'm coming from. When I warn, you can understand why I'm talking. When I rebuke, when I counsel, you can appreciate it. Not as just one rogue boy there who does not have work to do, who is doing pastor. But as somebody who labors over the ship. Confession number two. Pastoral insecurity and fears. Oh yes, we have our fears. We sound all uptight, confident, the voice of thunder. Or so you think. But many times, we tremble in fear. We go through our insecurities. Many times, we struggle with fear. Why should the pastor be afraid? I thought he's a servant of God. There are many reasons why a pastor struggles with fear. Some other people have dealt with this more than others. That's what I'm saying. What I'm teaching is not just personal. He is, however, trying to give you a picture of the realities of the pastoral office. So it may not always apply to me or absolutely apply to me. But every true shepherd goes through these issues. Every true shepherd does. The pastor is also afraid. Sometimes afraid of being abandoned to labor over people to labor over people to labor over people and treated eventually with contempt to give your time to give your energy to give your heart to a people and when it's time for them to reciprocate a, a small measure to treat you with contempt I know this feeling as a pastor, it is also known as a parent. And a mother would carry a child nine months, labor, 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 labor. When the child is born, trainings, 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 trainings. And when the child is now a CC, she now say, Mommy. I don't get belief for allergy. you. Some of you are not parents, so you cannot relate. The fear that will my labor not be in vain. It's a constant pastoral concern. 
You see it from Paul's writings. In case you think it's me that I'm canon, that's why I'm thinking like this. <laughs> Galatians chapter 4. And verse 11. I am afraid of you. Should be translated as I am afraid for you. Lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. I am afraid. I look at the lives of men of the world, Pastor. I look closely and I'm, I fear catch me. <laughs> I hope it is worth it. All these attempts to study and bring truth. I hope it is worth it. I hope it is worth it. I look at the attitude, I look at the feedback, and I ask myself, oh, sometimes fear they catch me. Lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Oh, it is possible to labor by grace and yet labor in vain in the context of the pastoral office. That a man as anointed as Paul will labor over the Galatians and he will still be worried. I hope I'm not wasting my time here. I hope people are really listening to me. I hope my shouting is not falling on deaf ears. I hope. I can only hope. I can only hope. There's not much I can do. I can't monitor your everyday movements. I can't check what you do in secret and private. But I can only hope that I'm not wasting my time. Pastors have their fears. They look at you and they check. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Or we should just do what every other person is doing? If labor is not appreciated, should we just do play? Make we just they play, they go. Just they play. Maybe that's what you want. Labor is not useful for you because you want to play, right? Maybe I should just give you play. Fears of is it worth it? For Paul, with all his grace and unction and revelation, to still be afraid, how much more the man in the Bumo show? I am afraid, lest I have bestowed upon you labor. Unfortunately, for many pastors, they have seen their fears come true again and again. Again and again. Seen somebody they labored over, toiled over, and you see the way the person has been starting out, just because the person relocated to Canada. And you say, a waste of time. Waste of time. Waste of time. A waste of investment. A waste. I wasted my time. It's a real fear. It's a genuine fear. It's not a fear as weakness. It's a fear of love. I am afraid for you. Lest I've labored in vain. You can make up your mind as a Christian that anybody who pastors you will never labor in vain never. That every bit of sweat and effort that they put into their work will be rewarded not with your gifts but with a life that turned out well. You can make up your mind. You can make up your mind. Or you can be a source of continual heartache, pain and regret that justifies the fears of your pastor. You can be that kind of a person. Who will be used as an example as to why pastoring is too difficult and too uncertain a job. You can be that kind of a person. It's your choice. Confessions of the pastor, pastoral fears and insecurity. The fear of not turning out well on the part of those you are laboring over. I fed you with the sincere milk. How did it turn out quash your cord? It's not how we taught you. It's not how we trained you. What happened to you? By my words and by my example, I laid the template for you to follow. How did you end up in a destination that does not add up? Every day is something we fear. Lest we have labored in vain. I made available nutrition from heaven. I thought you were feeding on it. I did not know you were throwing it away. I don't know if you remember growing up or if you while you were growing up, 
you practice some very terrible things because you were not happy with what mommy cooked. One day my mother cooked beans and I did not like beans. At that time, I did not want to eat beans. A, cook, a whole pot of beans. Poor woman she was. No funds, no money. And because we did not, have, we did not like beans, to give her the impression we had the beans, we went to carry the beans and bury it. Cooked beans, we bury it. I said, we have, we have almost finished the food, mommy. When she discovered, she told us we eat beans for one week straight. Some of you are like that. I labor, I toil, I teach. It seems as if you are listening, but you are not listening. You are carrying my words, you are dumping it. Dropping it somewhere. You are not using it, you are not practicing it. You don't make reference to it, you don't live by it. I think I'm feeding you. But alas, the thing is not entering your stomach. I'm afraid for you. Lest I labor in vain. The truth eventually, however, is that no pastor can really labor in vain. Because God is his reward. When are your loss? It's because he loves you. That's why he says, why? I want your life to turn out well. That's why I'm laboring. That's why I'm toiling. But if your life doesn't turn out well, it's your loss. You're not doing the pastor any favor by turning out well. <laughs> it's your life. It's your life. It's your loss. And if you gain, it's your gain. It's your profit. But there are real fears. Every true pastor goes through distance. Hoping, wishing that their labor will not be in vain. Another cause of fear is the fear of being abandoned. In what sense? 2 Timothy 4 10, their mass has forsaken me. Haven't loved this present world. There are seducers. Seducers. People who would attempt to invalidate the labors of pastoral authority. They will come to steal the words that has been sown into your heart. And eventually some people abandon, forsake. Let me give you a very, in all honesty, ridiculous and comical example to these things that we face. We've labored and told over people. It's a particular young lady who was in this church. And this thing I'm saying has happened more than, it happens almost every other time. But let me use this example because this one I, I labeled over. Every time she will come with a question, every time. And I would stand up, attend to her every single time. And it happened while she was here for about since six months. There was no time she didn't have a question. Sometimes I'll be coming in, I have to teach her the principle of first of all, giving me my private space. I'll be coming into prison, she will wait me and say, sir, before you go, please, before you go and preach, there's something I want to say. I say, why don't you wait for me to preach first? She had such answers, like many of you do. And then suddenly, she stopped coming to church. Which was not a problem I had gone through those kind of cycles again and again. I didn't know why she stopped coming. I didn't know when she stopped coming. I didn't know she stopped coming as it were. She just dropped out as it were. As someone looked up out of school. And then some weeks later, we learned that the reason why she stopped coming to church was because her mother said we don't cover our hair. And I began to ask myself, was he worth it? All the minutes and hours spent counseling, crying with teaching, explaining. Was it what it if somebody said because we did not cover a in our church? Stop now. That's not the issue. The issue is that you could not even demonstrate with to say, My mommy say you don't cover a, so I should stop coming. You just walked out. And I asked myself, was it worth it? Should I, next time, should I, should I give time to people like this? Should I answer those questions? Should I waste my time teaching and explaining? If on matters as covering air is enough to be divorced, 
And the truth is that we have had several cases like that. Several. <laughs> but you know, many times I tell my wife that, babe, some things I'm trying to explain to you, but you cannot relate. Because she's not in my office, even though she's married to me. But when she also began to do pastoral duties, she understands that you can live over somebody and something as flimsy as people who wear makeup in your church are going to hell. They're not, all your labors will be trashed in a camp. You will be walked out from as though you were nothing. It is what it is. Are you listening to me? Yes, sir. <laughs> I think it was the beginning of this year. I'm not sure who exactly sent me that text. Maybe it was Thomas or Praise, I'm not sure. I saw the text. It was January. And God knows I confess to you with all sincerity. As I opened the text, what came out of my soul was, oh, this one wants to leave the church. He's trying to tell me. Because I've received several of those kind of notifications. Pastors have God told me to leave the church. Pastors have left the church. God told me to do this. So I was I opened oh, this is another notification. And I have to come and preach with that. And I'm preaching, I'm not sure where this person I'm talking to too. He's writing his exit letter. But I have to still preach as though he was here forever. I will still preach and sweat and labor and toil. As if I'm talking to permanent people. Yet, it's many times in their minds, they have already written their resignation letter. They are waiting for a time to tender it. And they were add that the Holy Ghost told them. How do you think that makes me feel to hear that God told you to walk out of me without any sense of accountability? And I said, the same God I said, the same God who inspired me to bless you, to teach you, to pray for you. I've been a Shongoni. Confessions of a pastor, the fears of being abandoned for flimsy, silly, stupid reasons. Being ditched, being dumped, being changed. Just like that. And you still have to come with a strong face and minister. And it will continue to happen. It is what it is. <laughs> so you see, many people invent gimmicks, lay crosses on people who do, treat them like that. No true shepherd will do that. Bring all the pain. We will never do something contrary to the teachings of scriptures. Spite me all you want. Treat me like nothing. You cannot change me. You can't. I would confess on days like this, but I won't change. I will just move on life. I say, I say, we we'll go jump for heaven, all of us. And I go greet the second half. God not tell me you come out heaven because of me now. I don't show you. I will go hell. Now you are there. I will be there forever to get there. <laughs> Confessions of a pastor. Insecurity. It's like dating somebody and you are giving 100% because nobody would find a pastor who does not give all his commitments to the church and to the people. Nobody will find them comfortable to stay with. So the pastor is willing to give all his commitments, give all his energy, give all his labor. Yet the church member can, can put one leg into the relationship and say, I see they observe. And for any flimsy reason, you can walk out. And the pastor must continue. The pastor must stay despite your weaknesses, despite your shortcomings, despite your imperfections, but you can walk out of him for one of his weaknesses. But he must stay. He must stay. Ah, he's the pastor. He must stay now. But you can walk out. You are not feeling them again. You just go. You found a better place. You are off. But he has to stay. You are dating. It's like dating somebody who you give all, but the person is telling you, I don't know if I can marry you. But you go see the come, sha. <laughs> That's how Pastor Ren is. Yeah. That's how Pastor Ren is. That's how Pastor Ren is. You are giving everything, but you are not sure. The person can at any point just boom. And if I will be talking to you, ah, Pastor, what do you preach? Not too good, oh. But he is planning to leave, oh. Are you out there? Laboring. Giving your all. The person is giving 1%. But you are giving your all. 
that's what that's the that's the sufferings, labors, fears, insecurity of a pastor. He's not sure if you come back. Sometimes he's afraid to correct you. So sometimes he lets you be. Not because he has seen that you're on the way to a, dis- to a destructive end, but he's afraid of losing you too. So he says, maybe they will have sense. If I talk to them, they may they may run away. Pastoral fears, pastoral insecurity. Many times we only reconcile that by going back to God and say, God, no matter what happens, I will do what you ask me to do. Ultimately, you are my judge. These people will not judge me. I will do what I have to do. But there are days where the fears are much. You are preparing the sermon, you are thinking, <laughs> this is what I'm writing this thing to. Will they even stay? Do they see me the way I see them? I see them as family. I see them as part of my life. That's why I live over there. But do they see me like that? Do they see me like that? Are we still together here? Confessions of the pastor. Insecurity. Fears. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 5. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sense to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. One of the reasons Paul sent check ups, check backs, Timothy, go, Titus, go, check them, check them. He was always afraid. What if what we taught them, they're no longer practicing it? Many of you will change location. In all honesty, there's nothing wrong with that moving on with your life. But why would you receive pastoral labor for four years, relocate to Lagos, and become a Christian buddy? Why? Why? We, we create an atmosphere where the world is alive, the supernatural is alive. You will not go to a church where they are teaching you business skills. And after one year, everything you heard about the call of God fades away. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, you see Paul expressing his fears as it were again. Take it therefore unto yourself and to all the flock over, over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. So Paul was talking to pastors. He had done his pastoral work. He was going on back to his itinerant work. But he was handing the church to pastors. To feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. Go ahead, please. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in amongst you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own self shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. But he's able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among those that are sanctified. I gathered and called the graduate students of Lautech the other day in their Thanksgiving and told them, I said, see, what happens after now is your business. You may even block my number. There is my contact. I say, but please, we have laid an example for you. I say, five years from now, when people ask you, what church did you attend when you were a student? Please don't disgrace our name. Let's see that when they say Rama Chapel, they say, oh wow, oh yeah, they will, we can see that they labored over you. It's not that when, they say, when you say Rama Chapel, they will look at you and say, eh? Say Rama Chapel. Say Rama Chapel of who? That the Rama Chapel of Pastor Judah? Yes. And you ended up like this. Please. I beg them. I say, please. I've labored over you with tears in my eyes day and night. Please. The best you can do is to live up to what you have taught you. That's the best. I'm not asking for anything. Just live up to what you have taught you. Make us proud when you go out there. That's all we are. You know, 
how many churches have things like alumni, whatever, so people gather money, and even now that they are set up, they are no longer young, they fund the church. Somebody asked me to do that. I said, no, I, I don't feel comfortable with it. And the people that are living in each other and are big men, put them together in a WhatsApp group. Ask them for money. I said, no. I said, they will decide if they want to still remember our labels or not. It's their business. I'm not going to chase after anybody. Uh, I'm too weak for that, as Paul says it, in his foolishness. <laughs> I'm too weak for that. Uh, if they will choose to remember, well, if they don't, I beg. I beg, I beg. the work continues. Are you listening to me here? The fear of being abandoned. The fear of turning out where. I was thinking about it the other day and I just looked at myself and I said, oh, I just hope it's worth it. I was asked to do an online engagement. Online engagement. Just online engagement. They gave me 250,000 naira because I stand in front of the camera one hour on Zoom. 250,000 naira. I said, see, I don't go quit pastoring at least focus on that. When you're paid, the same thing I say to them is what I'm saying to you, and you're sleeping. Same thing I say. Same thing I say. I don't think there's nothing. My notes are the same. Can you watch your. She only. 250k. Boom, just like that. I've thought in other nations, Zoom. The kind of dangerous thing they sent to me. I said, wait, I said. The same thing I said to them in Rema, they were looking at me as if. Can you my boy in so gone? And I asked myself, is he worth it? Is he worth it? Are you listening to me? Yes, sir. Confessions of a pastor. Number three, pastoral jealousy. Why jealousy, as it were, is not a good thing. There is a dimension of it that is a spiritual virtue. <laughs> God himself expresses expresses this jealousy and he told Israel, your Lord your God is a jealous God with respect to the instruction concerning idolatry. Don't bow to any other God. Don't serve any other idol. Don't serve any other God. The Lord your God is a jealous God. And then you see you see Apostle Paul in his pastoral office also expressing this sentiment of jealousy. Look at it in 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. And verse 1 to 3. Okay, this is NIV, but I'm hoping that when we get to verse 2, it gives me the word I'm looking for. I hope you will put up with a little of my foolishness. I told you that when he talks like this, he gets why. But you're already doing that. Verse 2, please. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, pastoral fears, lest by any means as the serpent began in through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So, Paul introduces us to a concept as pastoral jealousy here. What exactly is it? Now, <laughs> let it be clear, first of all, that jealousy is usually a byproduct of love. And when people love you, there's a way they get jealous on some matters. Are we still together here? Yeah? The Corinthian church had this nasty attitude of revering and honoring other ministers of the gospel and even false apostles over Paul who actually labored by them consistently. They had that nasty attitude. It was only natural, as it were, for Paul to be jealous I'd like you to see the sentiment Paul expresses from scripture in this direction. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 16 to 20. 
you want to understand this statement from the first letter he wrote to them. In first Corinthians, you see him rebuking them for being divisive. I am of Paul, I am of Peter, I am of Apollos, and all of that. That was the Corinthian church. They had seemingly several influences over them. However, in first Corinthians 4, don't worry, okay. First, I'll come back to this, just hold on on this. In first Corinthians 4, Paul says certain things that affirms that all this honor you are giving people, no problem. But now me, gone, 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 be your papa. So, this is a background to some of the conversations you see here in 2 Corinthians 11. I said to you, let no man think me of a fool, if otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For ye suffer fools gladly. Seeing ye yourselves are wise. Sarcasm. For you suffer, the word suffer is permit. If a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take off you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face, I speak as concerning reproach, as though he had been weak, albeit wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly and bold also. Now put it in the NLT from verse 18. You need to understand what Paul is actually driving at here. Paul says, I've noticed that you guys don't honor me. I see the people you honor. I see it. I'm not blind. Those guys are bullies. They abuse you. They take from you. They deceive you. They feel entitled to your stuff, but you choose to honor them. And I see it. Since others boast about human achievements, I will too. After all, you think you are so wise. <laughs> but you enjoy putting up with fools. You put up with it when someone enslaves you. I notice those whom you honor are bullies. They enslave you with deceptive words. They tell, they tell you they had a dream that they saw you die and you run to them for special prayers. They take advantage of you. They take control of everything. Slaps you in the face. I'm ashamed to say that we've been too weak to do that. We don't, we don't follow that path of threatening people we won't give you a tithe and offering if you, if, you are not, if you are not told that you will go to hell. We won't tell you you are going to hell because you are not going to hell. We see the people you give to. We see the people you honor. They threaten you. So you honor them. You revert them. You fear them. We will not take that. Approach. We are too weak for that. He was jealous. He was jealous. We will play it straight with you. You never appreciate us. We will make ourselves available for counseling, for teachings. You never appreciate us. You don't have to feel a form to, feel, to see us. You never appreciate us. But the people who, they are put to last lesson. You can't win near them. They are the people you revert, you fear, you honor. You listen to, you obey. You so dangerous it. Huh? Paul says we are jealous. I'm jealous. And it's accurate, right? Holy jealousy. If you gave it to them, what disqualifies us? We have been too gentle. We have been too honest. We have been too pure in our ways. We have been too reasonable with you. That's why we are despised. Huh? We see the people you honor. We see them. And sometimes we ask, what is even about this person? There? What, is, what is it about this person? There? Come on. <laughs> I will tell you for free. Some of your cele some of the people you celebrate, some of your celebrity preachers. Nobody say na rumor. I know. But some of them come to confess to me. They call them my sermon. Here I'm come preach unto you. It just be say they get stage light. And packaging. And their voice no be like this. They know they, they speak pigeon. My preacher's voice they always use. Oh here the Holy Ghost is here. And is here to touch you. Now their voice be that. And you revert them. But because we come down to your level, you despise us. We see the people you celebrate that we, we just laugh. We just laugh. 
They said, every pastor, some, some of them are our disciples. <laughs> now, we they teach them, but you don't know. I will not go loud down. We don't boast. We don't boast. We stay humble. We stay meek. We stay cool. But sometimes we get jealous. Ah, kilo day. Kilo day. Are you getting me this morning? Yes, Confession of a pastor. We go through the motions of jealousy. We go through it. We go through it. Now, let me emphatically say this. In fact, not for Paul, I want to be sure I'm not dropping my notes because there's another point in this direction. Let me be sure that this quotation fits in here. But let me just leave it for the order. Okay. I'll leave it for the other emphasis. But pastoral jealousy. The pastor sees how you celebrate the apostle. He sees. Apostle. He sees how you celebrate the prophet. He sees. Holy. Those guys are laboring, no doubt. But your pastor is your pastor. I heard Reverend George say, <laughs> last week. The television evangelist will not come and do the ministry ceremony for you. So there is ministry all you want. In the day of trouble, Proverbs ever teaches that subject. You have to service your neighbor because in the day of trouble, it's your neighbor you will call. If you have a brother in Sokoto and trouble happens, it is your neighbor in Ogumacho that will save you. If I brother will come from Sokoto, <laughs> You are not you are, you are focusing on long distance Sokoto. You don't know there's somebody here who is watching over your back. You don't know. You don't see it as that. Let trouble not teach you sense. Let trouble not teach you sense. We see the you honor. Know, we see it. We're not blind. Sometimes we just keep quiet. Our oh, life, Daddy. It's one of those things. The family has become dishonored. It's not always a good feeling to be jealous, but it is what it is. We go through it and we confess now that we go through it. Does it make us feel good? No. We hope it was not so. We will not feel that way just because you are honoring others. We feel that way when we feel that what is due us is given to another. Today is Father's Day. Some of you will not call your biological father. It's your school father you are posting. Now, school father pay your school fees, Abby. Because your father is not photogenic. See, I think I saw. Buy me a fine, fine, cool Instagram face. You are not posting school father. Now, school father, I ain't gonna give you pocket money, Abby. You deceive yourself, or dear. Many times your parents see those things. They don't talk, but they are jealous. Modejia, Lori Rita, Mojia, Mojia, Mojia. Do you know how it makes them feel? You will soon be there. You will soon be. You will soon be a parent. You will be the one. Some we cannot relate. You will get there. You will see the hurt. Are you listening to me? I know what it is. Labor over people. 2 a.m. They are asking you questions. You are answering. Sometimes if you don't answer, they will get angry. Ah, I've been asking you this thing. I'm sorry. You want to I'm sorry. Labor over them. Labor over them. Labor over them. But in the day they are supposed to show any measure of honor, they will disown you to your face. Ah, he's a good guy. Now me, they call good guy. It's a good guy. Eh? This same you from your mouth. Good guy. I like him. One day I will open your fire. I will tell the world my labors over you. I will show them your WhatsApp chat. The things we discussed, the help I rendered, the services I offered free of charge, and in the day you were supposed to just give a commensurate measure of honor. He turned the opportunity down. One day, jealousy. <laughs> Are we still together here? 
Number four, confessions of a pastor. Pastoral possessiveness. Pastoral possessiveness. What does that mean? I'm not sure if that phrase is even English compliant, but I'm talking about for someone to be possessive. Like lovers can be possessive. When I called you, 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 they say you were not called. Who are you talking to? It rang four times. Who are you talking to? And God saving my brother, you should not be a sister. If it is a sister, you give an account of your stewardship. What did you discuss? What does she want? Why is she calling? You answer seven questions at the same time. <laughs> and pastors can be like that. The same thing happens as you grow up. You will notice sometimes parents who love you are very possessive. Any boy that comes to you, big man, who is that boy? Why is he calling you by this time? By 10 p.m. Doesn't he sleep? I saw you sharing one picture and you, you held him like this. People, who is that boy? It's not only jealousy that love expresses. Love too can sometimes be overly possessive. But many times it is for security's sake. The possessiveness of a pastor. Once again, this doesn't just apply entirely to me. Some of us are more matured. Some of us sometimes are win different. Some of us are win very hard. But like we don't care, Jerry. I heard one brutal statement by Pastor Lois Atkins. He said, if a false prophet deceive any of my church members, I will collect the number of the false prophets, ask for his account number and send him money. Yes. Because if after what we are teaching you, somebody is carrying you to a, bit, to, to a river to bait, and you follow them, you are stupid. I will call the prophet and say, give me, sir, you blessed me so much. Give me your account number. Oh, yeah. With all, with all we teach you, four people will still deceive you. you. You deserve it. But some pastors are very possessive. And one of these ways, one of the ways they express it is they say, I don't want you hearing any other preacher. I want you to listen to only my sermons. Like I said, not all of us are like that. But people who do that, I know why they do it. As a pastor, who loves this? Well, I know what it means. I know what it means. I know what it means to not talk people, not talk people in the way of purity, Christian purity, and they had one stupid someone. No matter what you will do, it does not matter. It does not matter. And before you know it, the person you raised for five years, all he said is that it does not matter. They had one stupid someone. And all the labels wasted because of somebody saying one stupid statement. Are you listening to me? First question to the four. Paul acknowledges the validity of many other ministry gifts. First question four. Start from verse eleven. Pastoral possessiveness. <laughs> Okay. Let's do from verse 14, please. I write not these things to shame you. Now, when he says, I write not these things to shame you, Paul also had done another ranting of foolishness, as it were, in previous verses. Uh, let me try and help you understand these things he wrote. Go to verse. Let's start from verse 7. Then we read verse 8 downwards like that. For who make it thee to differ from another? And what does thou, what hast thou that thou didst receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory? 
For if thou hast not received it, now you are fool. So when you read you are fool, it's sarcasm. Now you are rich, it's sarcasm. Paul is mocking these guys. You guys think you are fool? You guys think you are rich? You have reigned as kings without us? You are not big boys and big girls, right? I would to God you did reign that we might also reign with you. All of it is sarcasm here. For I think that God has set for us the apostles last as it were appointed to death for we are made a spectacle. The word spectacle is not a good word. This word describes what happens in gladiator wars where after they have beaten people they come and ridicule them publicly. We are spectacles unto the world and to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake. Once again, this is Paul in the flesh as it were. Because they had pushed him, they had provoked him to talk like this. But you are wise, or so you think. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honorable, but we are despised. We don't despise an hour, we both hunger and thirst, and are naked, and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place. And labor with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it, being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the field of the world, and of the upscoring of all things, Unto this day, I write not these things to shame you. So the intention had to be clarified because it was a strong rebuke, sarcastic insults. You guys think you are wise? You guys think you are rich? You think you are honored? I write not these things to shame you. But as beloved sons, I warn you. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, the word instructors seems like the picture the, in the greek it's the picture of like a nanny yeah a nanny yet have you not many fathers for in christ jesus i have begotten you through the gospel wherefore i beseech you be ye followers of me pastoral possessiveness paul was saying i know there are many options but follow only me i'm not saying other people's ministries are not valid but follow only me why was he talking like that? Go ahead in verse 17. For this cause I have left unto you, I have sent unto you Timothy, who is my faithful and beloved son, and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of, the, of my ways which be in Christ. My ways which be in Christ. All those other apostles seem to have their own ways. But I am sending Timothy because I have my own way, and I prefer you stay with my way. I also tell you why. As I teach everywhere, in every church some of you are puffed up as though i will not come to you but i will come to you shortly if the lord will and i will know so it's not like a threat not the speech of them which are puffed up but the power the kingdom of god is not in word but in power what will you shall i come unto you with a rod or in love and the spirit of meekness now what's the background here Paul says, I see you guys are learning a lot of interesting things from other ministers and maybe they are ministers of the gospel or false apostles like the case in the second letter to the Corinthian church. But Paul says, I will prefer you stay with my own method, stay with my own doctrine, stay with my own teaching. Some of you are confused because you hear too many voices. Simply put, that's all. And the voices may actually be good voices, but listen to me. Why do families have family doctors? I'm not saying other doctors are not legitimate. But somebody has the history of the family. He knows the predominant sicknesses. So in the days of an emergency, you most likely are supposed to call the family doctor. Because if you take the person to another doctor who does not have all the history, he may administer some medication that is good, but may eventually not be what the person needs specifically. Are you listening to me? Yes, Let me give you a doctrinal example. So somebody has... Is coming out from a background of addiction, addiction, and he's being trained to recognize that one of the things that fuels his addiction is that he is a legalist by doctrine. He has been taught that every time he does this, the Holy Ghost leaves him, and so every time he's choked in guilt and choked in fear and choked, so he doesn't pray, he doesn't read the Bible, he doesn't come to church because he's always struggling with guilt. Then they begin to hear other voices who are also preaching the truth. But the truth they are preaching does not exactly fit into what he needs to hear. What they teach, for instance, is that we all give an account. Now, they are loud in that sense. 
of what we do in our body. God will judge us, which is true. But because this person has a background that you don't know about, what you are saying is true, but it does not fit into that situation. It makes the person return to the guilt he's trying to overcome. One pastor say, yeah, only me. This is why they talk like this. We're not saying what other people are saying is falsehood, but sometimes it is truth that does not fit into your life. I know you. I know you. You don't need this truth. What Paul wrote to the Galatian church was not what he wrote to the Corinthian church. One was struggling with legalism, the other struggling with licentiousness. The same gospel, different emphasis to different audiences. Paul was their father, was their pastor. He knew what everybody needed, but they were hearing too many voices. So confusion, disorderliness, lack of growth. When you see pastors say, if pastors are so true, they'll say, don't marry my now, please. Marry him. That's possessiveness. Many times it's for security. But you may not understand. You may not understand. Different voices. You hear that one, hear this God general, hear that God general, hear this God general. When you have you have to be confused, you have to be asking me questions. Ask me questions. Go and meet your apostle and ask, ask, ask the apostle you have from the question now. This is the one that taught you. When you say pastor, say, hear my voice. Just stay with my voice. Trust me with my voice. My voice may not be as loud as theirs. There may be no boastings, no braggings about portals and dimensions and realms. But hear my voice. You get why? Are you listening to me here? You get why? So when the doctor, family doctor says, well, anytime there's an advantage, don't call anybody. Call me. I know this issue. I've been with it. It's not because he's try- he wants to cage you. <laughs> Are we still together here? Yes, confessions of a pastor. Are you learning something? Yes, we want to do confessions of a member. You two talk your own. Page, you don't use your preach. I get my own confession. Oh, there. I've exhausted my time here. Let's do one more confession. Ah, okay, sorry. Two more, please. But I'll be brief. There's a temptation for the pastor to change his approach. To deviate from the truth. We all go through that. When we notice that you prefer lies to truth, we are tempted. How do you make them too? How would they tell them truth? Did they sleep? They know they hear. Now, fables, they want they hear. Maybe we should go and look for fables and tell them. Paul was tempted to this point where he said, I don't brag normally. Paul, now they push me to brag. Okay. I know a man. Whether in the flesh or in the spirit, I don't know. And it was taken to the third heaven. You think, you, think, you, you think we can't brag? You think we don't have anything to brag about? It's a temptation to change methods. We notice you only respect those who bully you. And we don't bully you, so we are thinking, should we change? Should we be harsh on you, cruel on you? Since you are not going to love us and respect us if we don't take that part, should we change? The pastor goes to that temptation. We notice Holy Ghost service, you're not interested. Teaching service, I'm not interested. Communion service, I'm not interested. Should we be doing Shawama Sunday, Jesse Sunday? We go through that. Real food, you have no appetite for it. It's only junk you want. Should we go? We are tempted. Change the methods, change the approach. Paul said, I notice the people that slap you, you respect them, you give to them. Even I enslave you. He said, ah, but I'm too weak for that. I won't, I won't. But there's the temptation of God. You saw him boasting. Because they pushed him. He would normally not boast. Pastoral temptations. Pastoral confessions. What we are doing, we think it is right. Convince is what God will have us do. Many of you are not keen into it. Many of you are not interested in what we have received from heaven. And we are wondering, should we change our approach? If we change our approach, you may be happier, but you'll be worse off for it. We are not here to make you happy. We are here to make you holy. We are not here to tickle your fancy, to put someone that will make you excited. We want you to be strong. 
stamina strong. No one to raise weaklings. That's why we take this approach. There is nothing other than that. I've seen the record of programs. Seven Sundays of favor. Marathon Thanksgiving. Seven days of Thanksgiving. It's easy. It's, that one, I won't labor. I won't labor. But we say, it's not this thing cannot bless this. It will make them, <laughs> but they won't be blessed. Let's stay with the word. I commend you unto God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. But it's a temptation to truly change the method. Maybe they're not getting, maybe they will never even get it. You think I don't want this place to be full? You think I don't want people to come here? You think I don't know the kind of programs to do? <laughs> you really think I don't know the kind of programs to do? To get people here? But no. I would rather do what will keep you healthy than do what will make you happy. Your health is my concern. My primary concern is that you held. Are you listening to me here? You see me referencing the word. You think I cannot reference motivational speakers? I cannot reference movies? I've seen, I've seen many salmon titles. You know, it is a movie that inspired this salmon title. It's a movie. The one, from the way the person is talking, say, even the terms of his words, now move, this one not watch film. My film, they use print. Don't read the book. The wisdom of men. You aspire to inspire to Gragoya and Maguire. I can rhyme too. It's not hard to rhyme. I rap. Rhyme, rhyming is uh, punchline. What of wisdom? But will he help you? Will he help you? Will he help you? I can speak all, you know, composition. You know. I can speak as a, I can be an orator. I did that sometimes when I said, don't, don't respect me. And I said, okay, when I, the accent I will start with. When you hear the accent, Lassa, Lassa. But will all of that really bless you if I fake it? If I. Won't it be a blessing if I'm real with you? If I speak to you from the heart, not just from my head? We are tempted sometimes to change the methods. Let me give you this advice don't be a church member who tempts his pastor to change from right to wrong. He's very meek and humble. That's why you will respect him. You want him to change the method to being proud. Everywhere I go, I will say, this man of God is so humble. And I smile. Now that I'm humble, don't shall abuse me. Don't, now I, 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 I'm humble, I agree. But don't now use it to now, hey, no make a change out for you. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4. Do you want me to come to you with a rod of correction or the spirit of... I can't change it. The Commission Church, nasty and notorious. They said his, his bodily presence is weak. His speech is contemptible. It's only his letters that are weighty. Look at what Paul says. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1. Because you, you, you think that what those other super apostles are doing, you think I cannot do it. Lule anointing. And he recorded, see, see power, see power, see power. You are not a Sunday school teacher. With address. See power. <laughs> he just laugh. He just laugh. The problem is on television. See, see power. Such is the father, such is the rule. See power. Record it, record it, record it. You think I cannot do that? Do you know how many things we could have recorded of you? I'm put on. I say uh, when, when you see the Instagram post, you see yourself. You see yourself rolling on the floor. Holy Ghost service. You will know. You will now know that. So you, some of you don't like. You don't appreciate me now. No, you will soon change church. I'm waiting for you. I will see your pictures. People who will, who will use you to cast star. You know what you have. When I tell the mirror, don't snap any picture. That is not honorable. Who on the floor? Mm -mm. I don't need any proof. Anybody think I don't have power? No problem. One of my mentees came from Imo. He came to, he said, yes, sir. They say it's only word you know that you don't have power. I say, no. Anything they say is true. I'm not, I'm not be talking. Well, I don't post people rolling down on the floor. <laughs> Me. I'm too weak for that. 